Hello and welcome to the Global Forum for Food and Agricultural Innovation Pitch. My name is André Lampe and I'm the host today for the Innovation Pitch. And we will follow the topic of the GFFA, which is Sustainable Land Use Food Security Starts with the Soil. And for this Innovation Pitch we have six exciting projects who will present for five minutes and tell them what they have in mind for soil health and everything that has to do with food security thought from the soil up. And after the five minutes, everybody gets asked question from you, if you like, uh, also for five minutes. And directly after the innovation pitch, you have the opportunity to go into the deep dive with one of your favorite projects you will hear, uh, you will hear from today. Um, and in the deep dive, you can ask thoroughly questions and get into a discussion with all the people from the project, if you like. But you have to register at gffa-berlin.de for that. And also, when you want to ask questions in chat, you have to register also at gffa-berlin.de. Then you get the option to participate in chat and we have people in the back office who will um, well, collect all the questions and post the most frequent ones in front of me so I can ask them on your behalf. So when you have not already registered there, please do so. And yeah, we have six projects, as I've mentioned, and I will give you a short introduction to them. First one is Agrina, a Danish company who created the first European farm-based carbon certific certificate platform. Then we have the German Zambia Agricultural Knowledge and Training Center, AKTC, and they will broadcast uh, to us from Zambia directly. Then Gut and Böse, a research and development different methods of regenerative farming in the land of Brandenburg, about one hour away from Berlin. Uh, then regenerative farming pilot network by ALA with selected dairy farms from different countries. Then the coalition of action for soil health. This was developed in a multi-stakeholder approach for the UN Food Systems Summit in collaboration with the WWF. And uh, last but not least, Grand Farm, not Grand Farm, Grand, because the funder's uh, surname is Grand, uh, a market garden approach developed in collaboration with researchers in Austria. And now, with um, not much further ado, remember, register at GFFA. Berlin.de. And now with no further ado, we go to our first participant and to the first five minute talk from Agrina. And uh, I welcome uh, Erica Johnson. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, good afternoon. Doing well. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm very well and I'm excited to hear uh, from Agrina. So um, when you are ready, uh, five minutes are yours. Please go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for selecting us to participate in this program. It's really an honor to be among such a high caliber group of individuals today. My name is Erica Johnson, and I am the Sustainability Affairs Officer here at Agrina. We're a Danish farmers first startup uh, founded by agricultural professionals and tech savvies and farmers uh, based out of Copenhagen with 46 mission-driven individuals and field teams that are now in the UK and Poland. Our focus at Agrina is really on empowering farmers to choose more sustainable farming practices by giving them the tools and the resources to farm for the climate. And as mentioned, we are one of the first internationally recognized CO2 equivalent certification programs to offer reward and recognition for farmers who are uh, focusing on soil and sustainable farming practices. So soil is one of our planet's most important ecosystems supporting all life on earth and 95% of our food is indirectly, directly or indirectly produced from our soils. But what we've seen is due to poor farming practices and over intensifying soil it is becoming degraded. Um, conventional farming practices are depleting the soil and releasing carbon 
um, and is releasing carbon. 33% of the Earth's soil are already degraded and more than 90% could become degraded by 2050, according to FAO. So we're really in a state of urgency now. Um, but FAO also estimates that the global potential for sequestering carbon through our soil uh, to be 20 billion tons of carbon over the next 25 years. So by adopting conservative conservative agricultural practices, uh, farmers can turn their soil into carbon sinks and regenerate the soil in the process while also increasing profits and resiliency. Um, but today what's held back a lot of farmers in the development of our program and working with farmers for this, we found that the two major blocks that we're seeing or barriers to transitioning the switch has been based primarily on financial barriers operating at very low margins um, but also the knowledge barrier, knowledge gap, you know, having hundreds of years of yield optimization with conventional farming as the norm, and there also being a high level of inertia. So at Agrina, with the Agrina Carbon Program, we've actually worked to enable farmers to transit, transition through connecting them to the voluntary carbon market uh, to bridge the financial gap that exists but also connecting them to specialist advisors to bridge this gap on the knowledge perspective. We're now working with more than 160 um, farm advisors. Um, so on the support side with farmers, we have a built a platform that removes friction so that farmers can join the green economy. On the support side, we have uh, an online help desk and learning center, as well as best practices and strategies that are readily available for farmers, and then direct connection to trusted advisors, um, both externally and internally. Um, <clears throat> our, our program is basically, um, we've developed one of the first uh, soil carbon, excuse me, we've become one of the first European companies that are accredited to ISO 14064 standards. So this is the internationally recognized standard to quantify, measure, and report, and verify GHG emissions. Um, our methodology quantifies carbon sequestration and reductions on a field-by-field -field basis to produce carbon certificates, which can then be used to sold and offset um, unavoidable emissions and as a support mechanism for farmers. We've done this by um, aligning to the IPCC guidelines on GHG quantification and developed our program uh, with field level actuals over the past five years across multiple practices, incorporating the Lucas EU solar map and climatic inputs um, and GHG inputs from European universities uh, that have developed the Cool Farm tool, um, which is recognized by some of the largest food companies in the world as a scientifically independent and robust GHG modeling platform. On the verification side, we've developed an innovative approach to provide scale. So we use uh, remote sensing satellite imagery combined with NDVI algorithms to track biomass buildup and infield in behavioral pro, uh, patterns. And then also have an advanced analytics system that identifies outliers and off pattern deviations for follow up combined with site visits. And then on top of this, we work with third party um, third party verifiers to um, to verify all of the um, reductions and that have been made. So we do this by focusing on track or in our pilot program this year, we track multiple uh, activities to quantify CO2 reductions and removals, um, most significantly reduce soil disturbance, optimal use of cover crops or green cover, use of organic fertilizers and optimal residue management, keeping residues on the field. Uh, we do have minimum requirements for our program. Um, we, we do not allow for the burning of biomass on fields and also due to sequestration reversal, the program does not allow for traditional tilling. Uh, to avoid reversals of GHG removals and thus to ensure the validity and tradability of our certificates, uh, the program has a robust minimum adherence policy that applies throughout the contract period. And we have a permanence buffer for 25 years on our certificates. Uh, in the first year of our program, we've seen significant success. We started in Denmark. We're now operating at the pan-European level with, um, oper with farmers participating in the program in more than eight countries, um, ranging from Russia, Russia to Moldova, I mean, to the UK, excuse me. Um, and we have, in this first year, um, our first harvest year that we closed out, we had 
approximately just over 150 registered farmers um, that have enrolled more than 50,000 hectares into the program, equivalent to 72,000 football fields. And you, as you can see on the left, the um, the rate at which our growth had happened over the year and just this initial um, initial launch is significant. And we're now a team of more than 47 uh, employees and continuing to grow and expand, um, all operating under the same mission, and that's to support farmers and scale the transition to sustainable farming practices. Uh, you're, you're already over your time. I have to, okay, you know, and, and now you're done. The numbers are quite impressive. And um, there are some questions uh, to you. And uh, um, yeah, uh, interesting presentation. And the numbers you showed at the end, um, a really fascinating outcome. Uh, one question that popped up, you uh, mentioned um, remote sensing and use of satellite to control all your efforts. How do you want to make sure that the whole certified uh, farm is operated in the intended way? Because only, uh, it only benefits when all fields capture CO2. Um, are those remote sensing uh, um, efforts the only mechanism to monitor that? and um, uh, how you make sure that uh, you're not uh, taken uh, advantage of. So moving and leakage. Yeah, sure. So um, of course there's, um, there's risks associated with, um, with the program, with, I'm sorry, <laughs> there's risks associated um, with both leakage, um, which is something that we've really identified in this first year of our program, we're monitoring it very closely. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, well, what the one, I, one thing that we've identified is potentially res, uh, residue leftovers um, from a crop and straw residues burned for energy, but it's common scientific um, belief that right now this doesn't result in a significant leakage, but we're actively monitoring this. So we didn't see um, on our first um, in this first year, we did not see um, any leakage or this ha occurring, um, but we're, we've identified um, that, that, that this is something that it has a very low risk. But beyond, um, we have kind of two steps of verification. There's uh, internally, we're looking to monitor uh, at the satellite level, field by field, monitoring field by field actuals, but also doing our own quality control processes. So doing on-site visits um, for, for the modifications that have been made and then also going through a third-party verification process, which also includes okay. uh, on-field site visits as and, well. And um, uh, when you do all that uh, stuff, can you tell us about uh, the frequency? How often do you do it? And uh, when somebody um, joins the program with their farm, um, do they have to be uh, uh, all their fields or can they say, oh, well, only a subset? Yeah, we provide uh, the option for a field by field basis um, okay. to answer the second leg of the question. Um, and then um, as far as, I'm sorry, what was the first question? The, the first one, how frequent are your controls? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, so our field, we're operating at an annual harvest cycle rate. So we're doing continuous monitoring throughout the okay. very, um, throughout the program. So we have, um, as I mentioned, we have the, um, out, and when there's a trigger of an outlier or something seems as though it's not accurate, then we actually call the farmers individually and then we're doing a verification on an annual harvest cycle. Um, and one field is one project. Um, Annual okay. that's being done on an annual year. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks for clear, uh, clearing that up. And uh, we are already out of time for questions. Um, uh, I'm so sorry. So for everybody else watching, um, for more information and questions, the deep dives are directly after the innovation pitch. Please go to gffa-berlin.de to register for that. And uh, thank, uh, thank you, Erica Johnson from Agrina, uh, for telling us so much about this. So, and we move so on. Uh, uh, we move on to our next project, um, German Zambia Agricultural uh, Knowledge and Training Center, AKTC. Hello and welcome, Martin Sinkayeka and Helmut Anschütz. Hello to Zambia. Yeah, my name is Helmut Anschütz. I'm the team leader of the Zambian German Agricultural Knowledge and Training Center. And my name is Martin, I'm responsible for um, mechanization.
yeah, in our presentation, um, we will introduce you to the AKTC. We will provide some information why a soil cover is very important for the soil health. We explain two different tillage methods used in mechanized conservation agriculture. We will inform you on how we train the safe use of crop protection chemicals. And finally, we will summarize our training approach at AKTC. Who or what is AKTC? The Zambian German Agricultural Knowledge and Training Center is a project within the bilateral cooperation program of the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture, BMEL. We started our work in August 2014, and we offer a variety of training courses related to the use of agricultural machinery. We have a tractor driving school, and we do production and farming as a business trainings to provide the farmers with a complete knowledge base. Since 2018, we do field trials and research on mechanized conservation agriculture and climate adapted farming methods. The research is done in cooperation with the University of Zambia and the University of Hohenheim in Germany. Coming back to the soil, why do we need a soil cover? Conservation agriculture is based on three pillars, crop rotation, minimum tillage, and the permanent organic soil cover. In the tropics, we experience heavy rains and strong winds. The organic soil cover prevents water and wind erosion. It increases the water infiltration rate of the soil and it protects the soil life from the sun. The soil life needs nutrients and the organic soil cover is providing this food. A healthy crop which needs less crop protection can only be grown on a healthy soil. Many conservation farmers grow maize and soya in their crop rotation. To achieve a better soil health and a better permanent organic soil cover, AKTC advises farmers to include a cover crop into the crop rotation. A cover crop consists of several plant species which ensure a good transport of plant nutrients from the deeper soil into the topsoil. The cover crop improves the soil structure. Crimping of the cover crop before they are mature ensures a good layer of organic material. So conserving tillage methods, ripping and direct seeding. As mentioned before, another pillar of um, conservation agriculture is the minimum soil disturbance. At AKTC, we practice mechanized conservation agriculture. By using a tractor, the farmer basically has two options to get the seeds into the soil. One option is ripping before planting, and the other one is direct seeding. Before planting, a reaper penetrates the soil and creates a seed furrow. Ripping keeps the soil cover with the before mentioned benefits. It breaks up compacted soil layers and by planting into the rip line, it minimizes soil disturbance. A more economical way of compared to ripping is direct seeding. A direct seeding planter opens the soil and plants the, soil, the seed direct into the untilled land. By practicing the direct planting, the farmer spares one pass on the field. Because direct planting saves time and diesel, it is the most economic and climate-friendly tillage method. To meet the increasing demand for food, farmers must produce more on the existing fields. This can be achieved by applying, among others, crop protection chemicals. To minimize the effects of chemical usage to the health of the farmers and consumers, AKTC provides training to tractor service providers and farmers in professional crop protection and application. This training course intends to reduce the exposure of farmers to the chemicals and it reduces the application rate at large. From trials uh, to practice. Let us close this presentation by pointing out some of AKTC's innovative approaches. AKTC is a hands-on training center, which immediately transforms research results into practical advice and training. The farmer trainings take place in our classroom and on the fields. The farmers can see and also apply the different farming methods we are teaching. We are emphasizing on soil quality and soil health as a sustainable success factor for farming. We want to convince farmers to practice conservation agriculture by pointing out the ecological, 
and economic advantages. AKTC is a leading project in mechanized conservation agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa and fits perfect into the regional concept of BML's bilateral cooperation program for Southern Africa. Thank you very much for your interest in our work. Uh, and thank you, Martin and Helmut, for this presentation and insights of all the projects you are doing. And uh, we have uh, already some questions. And uh, when you have further questions, uh, please head to the chat and type them in. I will ask them. But at first, I want to ask um, your training methods. And uh, you showed pictures from... Um, the training on uh, machinery and uh, stuff like that. Can you walk us through how that uh, works? How long is the duration of such a, a training uh, course and what can be achieved? What, what is uh, the, the main topics that need to be taught in that to make uh, soil health better? Yeah, thank you very much for that comprehensive question. Um, starting with the length of the training courses, uh, we have one day mm -hmm. courses up to courses which last uh, for two weeks, so basically 10 training days, where we combine several trainings um, together. And the daily trainings um, are about one topic. So, one topic, for example, uh, would be calibration of fertilizer spreader or calibration of seed drills um, and coming regarding to the soils. Um, <clears throat> due to our research, uh, we modified the equipment we are using. Basically, you cannot buy equipment from the shop. It needs no modification so that it can be used at our place. Mm -hmm. And that's what we try to explain the farmers as well, how they can modify their equipment in order to work on their farms for their specific soil, so on their specific soils. Okay, uh, 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 quite interesting. So the, uh, um, the appliances for, for a tractor, for, uh, um, for example, need to be modified, you said. What are the um, uh, prerequisites for uh, doing farming in uh, the region you are working at? And um, uh, you also mentioned in the talk uh, about direct planting, uh, a no-till uh, uh, approach, when I've uh, uh, got your meaning right. Um, what are the challenges? Uh, um, where you're working at. How's the soil different compared uh, to other areas uh, of the world and what challenges you have with that? Andre, thank you so much for that question. Um, the issue of modification is a, a special one in the sense that uh, uh, the modification will entirely depend on the types of soils that you are dealing with. Uh, in Zambia, where we are at the moment, there are different regions, and each region has got its own peculiar kind of soils. So whatever modification we do at our training center might not be necessary in another area. So the mm -hmm. equipment will be the same, but as you uh, engage the equipment, as you go into the field, and as you try to do what that equipment is meant to do, that's when you realize, uh, depending on your soils, what kind of modification you need to do. So basically in our region, which is the central region, we've got heavy soils. And uh, in other areas, we've got sandy soils, others have got loamy soils. So the type of modifications we do are modifications that will enhance our productivity in what we are doing at, uh, at our training center. So it might be different in any other, any other place. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks for answering that. And from chat, uh, the user Carla is asking, what role do seed-resistant varieties play in the training courses? Um, the, which seed a farmer uses, uh, we are the opinion, is a decision of the farmer. So what we are training is basically the technology, the, the precision in, in planting. How do you get a precise planting pattern? How do you plant the seed into the right depth, uh, the right distance, right plant populations? So we are not um, elaborating or training on different seed varieties. From time to time, we invite seed companies who can answer those questions to our trainees. But ah, okay. as AKTC, we don't do that uh, in our trainings. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for answering uh, the questions and giving uh, us uh, insights and the talk about the project in Zambia. That's all the time we have. Um, and after this uh, innovation pitch, you have the opportunity to join um, Martin and uh, Helmut for a deep dive. Please go to gffa-berlin.de. This is the GFFA innovation pitch. And we go to our next participant. And um, from Zambia to Brandenburg, uh, Gut und Bösel. And we have Benedikt Bösel here. And uh, he will tell us something about what he's doing in Brandenburg and what uh, we can learn from that. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be able to talk to you today. Um, and my title is, Let's Start to Think and Act Beyond Farming. And I'm going to try to tell you why I think this should be uh, the new us, so to say. Um, and it's really one message that I want to pass on, and I would hope that sticks with you from my presentation, and that is that agriculture is the solution to many of the biggest problems of our time. But in order to get there, we need to do one thing, and one thing very, very carefully. We need to assess the positive and negative externalities of production. Once we have done that, we can also at a later stage start to monetize them, but also, of course, implement them and um, bring them in contact with different um, philosophies of land use systems. Um, so who am I? Benedict Bösel. Um, we started um, our own foundation last year. We are a family farm and forestry um, managing roughly 3,000 hectares. And we are not comparable to Africa, probably in most spaces, but also in one of the driest areas um, with sandy soil here in, in Brandenburg, one hour east of Berlin. And what we have started is a journey on um, testing and implementing and developing different regenerative multifunctional land use systems. Um, and for this, um, we can actually gather all the information and the scientific monitoring analysis through our foundation, Fink Stiftung, that we implemented last year. Um, what is to take from this? We are already facing what climate change feels like. We have been in the last four or five years, so we kind of have, the heart, have, have our pulse at the heart of what is to come on a global scale. And what we mean by multifunctional regenerative land use models is combining nature's strength as nature would work if we wouldn't interfere, because we believe if we understand the complexity of ecosystems, if we understand that the role that we as humans can play has to be also formulated by the needs of healthy ecosystems and healthy soils in particular, we can actually take better economic management decisions when it comes to land use. And this we show through different on-farm field trials and Syntropic Agroforestry, which stems from Brazil that we have implemented, is really looking at how can I bring more harvests on the same field in the same year, and thereby closing the nutrient cycle, increasing biodiversity, and increasing also the, the health of the soil, but having a system that is pretty much not dependent on external inputs. The next thing is holistic grazing, where we actually reintroduce the animals into the cycle to close the nutrient cycle, to build carbon in the soil, to increase the water storage capability. And we actually combine this with agriculture usage of those, those fields. That means we produce food for humans and for the animals in the same year on the same field. And we even reduce our costs and produce beautiful products. And on, on top of that, we have forest, uh, a, a pine monoculture that is pretty much covering the whole of Brandenburg, which of course has no resilience. And here we are doing large forest, forest transformation plots, varying in size and scalability, but all bringing in back biodiversity and, and a lot uh, of different species. And as well, compost is such an incremental part of the future. And, um, 
here we sort of bring it together with the last aspect that we are focusing on, that is a tree nursery, where we already from the very beginning start to grow our own regional and climate adaptive species that we will later plant out into the fields. And from here, really, there's one thing that is the, the really the important part. That is, it's all about independence. And one claim that I came up this morning, which I think makes a lot of sense, is independence is for farmers what biodiversity is for ecosystems. We need that. It's about resilience because climate change doesn't, ma doesn't mean it will become drier or it will become wetter. No, it means it will become less, uh, less predictable. We will have to endure variations that we do not be, uh, are able to um, predict, and therefore we need healthy ecosystem and healthy soils. What do we believe we need to add, or what do we believe we can add in this discussion? It's pretty much the data and the figures and the scientific um, monitoring and deriving not only investment costs and harvest costs, maintenance costs, and yield estimates, but also estimating and monetizing or monitoring and analyzing all the external factors of production. So what really happens with biodiversity? What really happens with soil and carbon storage in which kind of depth? What about water uptake and water storage? What about social aspects of agriculture? All of these things play a huge part in the question of how we want to do agriculture. And once we have analyze all of these and we have the data, we can actually then assign them to specific land use models. And so, our focus, of course, is multifunctional land use model, agroforestry, silver pastoral models. And we believe that this is uh, a great um, way of actually establishing um, potential for the future. Benedict, and you're already a little bit over time, or not only a little bit, uh, a minute. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Let me just finish the last part. When you will, can do I'll, it in I'll two or three sentences, I would be happy. Wonderful. I will make it short. It's really about the holistic assessment of agriculture, of land, people, and ecosystems. And we can get there if we start to assess all the decisions that we take with regards to land use models through a precise analysis of the positive and negative externalities. And if we do that, we will reach an understanding that agriculture is the key to solving the biggest problems of our time. So, and um, the future is bright if we understand that it lies beneath our feet. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you, Benedict. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, uh, coming in. Um, one from chat is um, what, chain, uh, what change framework conditions would be needed to scale this form of agriculture more quickly and cost effective? Um, well, to be honest, it's an easy question, but a difficult answer. Well, first <laughs> of all, we, what we need to do is we have to completely transform the education process, program, uh, the, the uh, financing program. We have to assure access to land. We have to show access to finance and different forms of finance for people that are in farming. Um, we have to change the subsidy system. Um, so there, there is huge things that we need to need to address. If you ask me, we also have to put more, let's say, pressure on companies to take over responsibility for ecological and social side effects of what they're doing. But the thing is that we are in a situation that many, many farmers all over the world are stuck in their production systems. Um, they have been investing, they are high in debt, um, they have specialized because for, for, for a long time we wanted as much food as possible for the lowest price. Yeah. Um, and now we need to question ourselves, how can we help them to get out of there? And that's really the big thing. We can talk about all the cool things that technology might be able to do at some point. Um, but the reality is we need to help the farmers now and we need to be fast about it and technology that keeps on us in the circle of exploitative philosophy of land use models making the farmers even more dependent that is not the right solution we need to use technology to have um, a humble view on, on the complex ecosystems 
uh, and of nature that will enable us to become more profitable and that's really what we need. Yeah. You mentioned in your talk uh, development of software and technologies. Um, which software and technologies were not available to you at your farm when you started to develop uh, them? Can you walk us through uh, it, what you have to invent for that? What made it that you uh, have all these great uh, uh, ideas implemented at your farm in Brandenburg? And maybe a quick answer? I'm sorry, we are <laughs> quite pressed on time. I will, I, will, I will try. I took over the farm in the end of 2016. And in the beginning, because I came from the technology venture capital agriculture startup side, I thought technology is the key, but I realized that a lot of the technology is still in that same system, that same understanding of, of being, being sort of exploitative with ecosystems. So if your baseline assumption of agriculture is horizontal monoculture, one harvest per year, that's not going to be good enough. It is mm -hmm. not a really intelligent system. We need to combine more species, more plants, animals, trees into the, into the, the landscape And if we do that, then we can bring in technology to help us understand the complex interdependencies of the plant and the soil and the animal. And that's where, how we can really change it. Um, but for now, too much of the technology is unfortunately going into a direction where I would rather not see it go. Okay. Thanks for answering all the questions. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Benedikt Bösel from Gut und Bösel. Uh, to uh, tell us about their approaches. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, and when you want to ask a question in, uh, in chat, you have to register to gffa-berlin.de. Please go there and use the chat extensively. I will ask your questions, promise. So, and uh, we go uh, next uh, to, to the next project, uh, which is called the Regenerative Farming Pilot Network by ALA. And, um, Hello and welcome to Kaspar Tormund Nielsen. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm, I'm great. Good, that, that is great to hear. When you are ready, I'm really eager to hear about uh, the network uh, ALA started with selected farmers from different countries. So the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm super excited to, uh, to be here with these uh, innovative colleagues. Uh, it's, It's a great pleasure for, for me uh, to, uh, to uh, present uh, this and on behalf of, you can say, the old lady I'm working for. Uh, it's uh, Ala Foods uh, and uh, more than 9,000 farmer owners. We are super proud to be here to talk about the return to farming uh, pilot uh, that, that we are undertaking uh, as a company and the journey that, that uh, we are on. A little bit first on, on the old lady uh, that I'm working for. She's a, uh, it's, a, it's a dairy cooperative, so we are owned by uh, 9,400 farmers. We produce uh, almost 14 billion kilos of, of, of milk every year. So it's obvious that when we do something, uh, we have a huge responsibility, but also, of course also a, a huge possibility to make a change. So when we move, You can say we move the whole uh, dairy uh, production. We represent almost six to eight percent of the European milk production. So when we move, we move also the, the dairy production in, in Europe, which is a huge responsibility, but it's something we take pride in. We as a company want to be part of the solution. And we've a lot of examples on, on how to do that. We introduced, for example, our quality assurance scheme, Ala Garden, already back in. 2003, which is mandatory to all our farmers. We have engaged in the green ambition. We've done climate checks on farm. We started already back in 2013, 14 on the farms. Uh, and almost all our farmers are doing climate checks today. And we also committed as a company to the 1.5 uh, scientific based target uh, to, to reach the, the Paris agreement. So we are there to be part of the solution. We acknowledge that we are part of the challenge, but we also want to be part of the, the solution. And I think the next step on our journey is what we're talking about today, which is our regenerative farming pilot. But first, a little bit to, to regenerative farming. It's, you can say it's, it's, there's not a hardcore legal definition, but uh, there's a lot of different definitions, but, and there are common themes uh, that we, we see uh, identified in, in these uh, various definitions. 
it's about improving soil health. It's about promoting uh, promoting biodiversity, improving water and air quality, and enhancing animal welfare. But in a in an ecosystem approach, so we need to do it in a holistic and an ecosystem way, and that's where we, as a company and with our farmers, we want to to make a difference and responding to a lot of the planetary dark boundaries we are faced with uh, on the planet today. So what we are doing is a it's a, it's a a farmer-led approach where we want to inform uh, a future approach and develop relevant principles and practices for success to scale. And uh, what we have done here is that we've selected 24 pilot farmers uh, in the UK, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and the Netherlands, both organic but also conventional farmers, to work uh, with these different measures. And then the idea is that it's a farmer-led approach and a farmer-led program with immersive training and coaching. We want to implement principles and practices. We, of course, want to measure the ecosystem processes and what are we actually achieving, but we want to do it in collaboration and in consultation with experts. We know as a cooperative, we can only receive the, get the best results together. And uh, in particular, working with experts, we have a a lead collaboration with the five farms, but also local experts who can deep dive at the individual level with the individual farms in their language. And then, of course, we're also looking to industry collaboration to further promote the learnings that, that we uh, did, uh, achieve. And then just looking into the quickly into the program in the deep dive, we can go deeper into it's a five year, it's a five work streams. It's over a minimum of four years. First process was here in September, where we kicked the program off. Uh, where it was the selection of the different farmers, both conventional and organic farmers, as mentioned, across different nationalities and regions and areas. We've already conducted the first uh, round of training with their farmers. In the training, it's very much about encouraging a mind shift. It's about understanding and the interaction we have with nature and embrace it and promote ecosystem mm -hmm. processes. We are planning now uh, and implementing the, as the next step where we'll have the one-to-ones on farm with local expert in order to develop their plans and their measures in order to promote uh, regenerative farming practices. And then, of course, we want to measure progress. The first year will be very much about creating a state of play status. Where are the farms in order for us to measure progress as we move along uh, in, the, in the program? And then a very important part is knowledge sharing. It's knowledge sharing the farmer to expert, but also the pilot farms with each other at regional level, but also across markets. But also the farmers, pilot farmers share their knowledge with the other uh, ALA community of uh, 900 uh, organic farmers, but also the, the 9,000 9, uh, 9, farmers in total. So sharing the knowledge and of course also externally share yeah. the knowledge and our learnings with external. I, uh, uh, this uh, leads to many more questions, and you're already out of time. So, uh, and there are. Just a quick one. In yes. the deep dive, yeah. you can even meet uh, one of our farmers, uh, okay. Grill, and uh, my expert uh, colleague, uh, Anna Karin Modi Edman. Looking forward to meet you in the deep dive, but ready for questions. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kaspar Tomo Nielsen from ALA. Um, and there are many questions. So uh, you mentioned that the concepts you're developing, that uh, experts locally uh, as well as from, from the scientific field uh, uh, are involved. So can you give us some examples which measures uh, do you want to take? So this is input from your side and also expert side. So it's not only exchange of best practices between farmers, right? That's, that's correct, and it's a very important part for us. Uh, as one of our farmer states, uh, we don't know what we don't know yet. Uh, and it's very much about creating that mind shift. And here we've engaged with uh, one of the five farms, they are called, which are the, you can say, the leading experts in developing the program, uh, together with us setting the, the agenda. But then together with our farmers, uh, that's why we call it a farmer led program. We want to evolve the program so it's practical and also doable at farm level. And then working with those experts, we work with national experts uh, uh, in Germany. It's a, it's a gentleman called uh, Sebastian Böhm, uh, who has a super knowledge of regenerative farming, and, and he will support the local farmers uh, in developing their individual plans. So it's 
combining knowledge from outside with mm -hmm. the knowledge of our farmers and, and trying to, to create uh, benefits uh, from that, which we will then be able to, to scale across the farms in Ottawa. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. For, uh, directly from chat, there was a question. Do you have uh, solutions in your program that combine the reduction of methane emission and soil improvement? That, that's, you can say, a, a core of the focus, improving uh, soil health and also uh, the carbon sequestration in soil. And yes, there are solutions and there are practices which can, which can uh, promote that. So uh, that is, is something we want to want. And the whole thing has to be practical at farm level and doable also at scale. So yes, we have solutions and, and, and uh, suggestions for that uh, and want to try to work on implementing that at, at farm level. Uh, with our farmers. Do, do you have an example for that? I think uh, um, that was um, think, most interesting. Yeah, I think uh, uh, permanent pasture and how do you uh, how do you uh, how do you do grazing of areas? How do you uh, how do you use uh, uh, plants uh, over the soil so you have a permanent protection of of the soil? So these are examples on on, on how you do it, but also how do you time your your grazing period, how do you move your cattle uh, compared to uh, the seasons in order to optimize both the, the feeding but also uh, the soil health and keeping the soil healthy. Okay, um, thanks for answering that. Uh, since the project is only planned for, or, or, I, don't, I don't want to, meant, uh, to say only, but it is planned for four to five years, if I uh, got you right. Since uh, results of regenerative, uh, regenerative farming um, uh, often yield results only after a longer period of time. Do you have measures or, or even planned an extension for uh, really sustaining good practices you find and establish? Um, uh, can you go into detail what comes after that? What is the expansion plan, so to speak of? And that will be part of, uh, of uh, you can say, the democracy. We are a dairy cooperative, so the farmers will decide the journey. But ah. Okay. As, as you know, this is a, the start of the journey and the commitment now is for at least uh, four years of, of these command, uh, farmers who are committed. But as a company and also the farmer democracy, we are, we are committed uh, long term uh, to uh, get in, improvements in, in these areas. So working with our farmers to improve soil health and, and, uh, and biodiversity, but also the climate. Uh, so that's a part of our commitment. So we'll have to work with these practices and carve out solutions for that. Okay, thank you very much, Kaspar Tormund Nielsen. That's all the time we have for questions. And you can um, meet him and also one of the farmers, as we've heard in the deep dive, please go to, when you've not already done so, go to gffa-berlin.de. There you can register for the deep dive and also for chat to ask question, uh, questions to every project that is presenting here. And this is the GFFA innovation pitch and we start with the next participant and this is the Coalition of Action for Soil Health. And hello to you, Lei Winowicki. Hello, <laughs> thank you that you are here. Thank you so much, it's great to be here. Yes, I'm Lee Winowicki, I am a soil scientist and I lead the soil and land health research theme <laughs> at C4ECRAF. I'm calling in from Nairobi, Kenya. Oh, and <laughs> hi to Nairobi. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, and I'm really eager to hear from you. So uh, five minutes, the floor is yours. Excellent, so today we're going to talk about the coalition of action for soil health. As we know, soil is in the spotlight of the global agenda, and I could not be more pleased with the theme of this year's Global Forum for Food and Agriculture. I think it is the perfect way to kick off 2022 by putting soil where it should be, right at the center. And let's hope that the three upcoming COPs that we have this year also follow suit, because we're all here, because we know healthy soil is critical for achieving food and nutrition security, for ecosystem restoration, and for achieving climate change goals. And we're here because as the first speaker and several others have mentioned, land degradation is severely 
impacting our vulnerability, our resilience of ecosystems and livelihoods. That means that we need to redouble our efforts. There's a need for innovations, for stakeholder action to restore and maintain soil health. All those organizations are doing an amazing job and we have to keep this momentum going to make sure that eventually, soon, we can start saying we have a decrease in land degradation each year. And I think all of the previous speakers um, would agree that their efforts are contributing to that. So because of this need to redouble our efforts, the UN Food Systems Summit held a stakeholder process where member states and civil society contributed game-changing solutions. We gathered these game-changing solutions and what became rooted through the process of the UN Food System Summit was this new coalition. It's the Coalition of Action for Soil Health. It has a very simple objective, improve soil health globally. And we must do this by addressing the critical barriers that currently constrain farmers from adopting and scaling healthy soil practices. For example, the first speaker was talking about incentives for the carbon market. This coalition is going to address implementation, monitoring, policy, and investment barriers in order to scale soil health. Now, Allow me to just spend a minute on this slide because we really have been bringing together expertise globally from um, farmers and governments to really identify the critical nodes for a systems change to support farmers, producers, consumers, land managers, pastoralists. So on the left, we talk about this need for robust and rapid monitoring systems. I'm a scientist and we know that there's power with knowledge. So we really want to translate science into action. Then there's the capacity building for and co-learning about soil health innovations. We just heard there are no silver bullets. These innovations must be tailored to the context. On the right side, we talk about these financial incentives that need to be equitable and transparent. And this requires a collective action of multi-stakeholders and really this enabling environment to support evidence-based policy. Let's hope that we can encourage more governments to include soil health, soil carbon in their NDCs. The idea here is to build synergies with existing initiatives and we see the focus of soil as a unifier and the championing the business case for private and public sector. Our coalition members continues to grow. I really, this is a call for anyone interested to join. We have NGOs, we have private sector, member states, civil society, research, because we're translating science into action. We've been engaging so much in 2021, from opinion pieces to videos, to launching at the summit to COP26 events. And we're going to keep that momentum growing in 2022. We just had an amazing partner meeting yesterday. We're collaborating in consultations, developing the strategy. As I said, the super year, UNCCD, CBD, UNFCCC COP. We have the World Economic Forum. We invite member states to join us in a UNIA declaration. And in closing, because I know we're out of time, we really want to leave everyone with the message that through stewardship, we can improve soil health. We must increase our financial investments in soil health. This coalition of action can help fill these gaps. We want to remind our, everyone it's about encouraging farmer innovation and to translate science into action to inform policy and decision. Thank you so much for the time. Lei, thank you so much to being so on point with your presentation. Uh, on point, uh, not only on the topics, but also uh, on really only taking five minutes. There are a lot of questions I want to ask. So you mentioned you're a scientist. I'm a scientist um, myself. And the big question which popped into my head is, how do you make sure that your rigorous monitoring you're planning to do of soil health gives you reliable results so that actions are truly evidence-based.
because there are so many factors that uh, many factors that can blur that um, locally uh, stuff like that. Can you have you an answer to that? Absolutely, and thank you so much for the opportunity. So one of the best things about science is that we're objective, right? We adhere to the scientific method. So our our research is objective, and we are at a turning point in terms of the scientific community, where we no longer want our data and results sitting on shelves. We want to make them accessible. We want to make sure we're communicating to non-scientists and that really this evidence is translated into um, communication outlets for policymakers, farmers, decision makers at all scale. And yes, my expertise is actually in monitoring soil organic carbon dynamics. And I think that right now we are having amazing opportunities to bring robust monitoring from the field scale to the regional scale to the global scale. And I couldn't agree more with you. We need to make sure our science and knowledge has local relevance and global relevance. Okay, so uh, following up on that, uh, you're speaking of um, open science practices so that you make not only uh, the results open but uh, the data and also have science communication uh, uh, on the top of your mind not only to the broader public but also to, uh, to policy makers. Am I getting that right? Yes, absolutely. And we actually call this a co-design process. Mm -hmm. So we are actually co-designing tools for displaying, visualizing, and sharing data with the end users. We are not separating the end users from the data collection or the visualization. It's so important that we're engaging together with all stakeholders across the entire process and that I may love box plots to display variation in soil carbon. Me too. But someone else may prefer a table or a pie chart. This is a simple example. So we need to make sure we're displaying and communicating these data so that it is understood and internalized to ensure we have evidence-based decision-making. Okay, uh, time for one more question from our GFFA chat. Uh, in what ways or uh, capacity can private individuals get involved in your project? This is absolutely a great question. I will share the link um, to the UN Food Systems Summit community and the Coalition of Action for Soil Health. And you just set, click the button, I'm interested, and we will respond. And we are getting responses every day, new countries signing up, Everyone is invited. It is a coalition of action for soil health. We need to come together and scale healthy soil practices globally. Okay, um, thank you, Leigh. That is uh, all the time we uh, have. And thanks for answering all the questions. And I think you will be also available for the deep dive. And um, we already seen him uh, in chat uh, a lot of uh, interest in that. Thanks for being here. Uh, so, um, to take part in the chat and also in the deep dive after this innovation pitch with the uh, different projects, register at gffa-berlin.de. And now we come to our next project, the last one, but definitely not the least one. Uh, this is a Grand Farm or Grand Farm, and I say hello to Alfred Grand. Hi! Hello everyone. Hi Andre. How, how is the weather in Austria where you're sending from? It's sunny but super super windy. So I don't I, I hope you don't hear the storm. No, no, you, you're coming uh, across perfectly. So um, five minutes. Uh, the floor is yours. I'm eager to hear about Grand Farm. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be here growing food soil and people at Grand Garten at the same time. When we applied for this, uh, when we did our application, we were asked by the organizers of the conference to answer one of these questions, one of the four. But we at Grand Farm, we would like to answer all of these questions. So 
Let me introduce myself first. My name is Alfred Grant. I'm an organic farmer, and we have a research and demonstration farm here in Austria near Vienna. We're working on approximately 90 hectares, and uh, we are part of the global network of lighthouse farms from Wageningen University. Our focus is on one side, soil health. So I don't have to explain that in this conference. On the other side is agroforestry. So bringing back trees into arable land and market gardening. But what is market gardening? Let me introduce you to our team and I will read this definition for you. Market gardening is a rediscovered form of land use where a diverse range of fresh, organic vegetable, herbs, and fruit are produced on small land by hand. Healthy soil is at the heart of market gardening, aiming for the highest possible yield, while at the same time regenerating soil health and protecting the environment at the maximum level. The produce is sold directly to local citizens and businesses, enabling a strong connection and mutual respect and appreciation between producers and consumers. So this is market gardening, but back to the questions. How do we improve soil protection at Grand Garden? Well, we do crop rotation well, uh, with cash crops and cover crops. Uh, we apply a zero pesticide strategy. We don't use any mineral fertilizer and we don't use any heavy machinery. And we use mulch and compost. Number two, how do we restore degraded soil? Well, we use compost, we use mulch to cover the soil, we use cover crops, crop rotation, as I already explained, but we also use seed coating and root bathing for transplanting uh, to bring in fresh microbes from the diverse range of compost and vermicompost. We do not use any chemicals and no soil compaction. Question number three, how can we make the use of finite land resources more sustainable? Well, in market gardening, we use finite land resources in a biointensive way without degenerating, but regenerating it. In market gardening, does not need only small amount, does only need small amount of land. So you can grow a lot on a small land. Number four, how can farmers worldwide get fair access to land? Well, again, with market gardening, you only need a small land, and then the available land can be divided to much more people, uh, which can feed much more families and have a profit from there. But is this all we can do? Just care about soil? Or could we do even more? What about all the challenges that we still face, except of soil? climate change, loss of biodiversity, pollution, COVID, unemployment rate, economic fragility, and much, much more. Do we need to change there also? Well, let me tell you, market gardening has an impact on 11 out of 17 SDGs. So we do not only produce food, we do not only care about the soil and restore uh, degraded soil, but we also train people so we had 18 interns here on our farm last year from eight different countries. We create jobs on the farm in the rural area. So we reduce the uh, average age of people in the farming sector. We care about biodiversity. We care about adapting to climate change and much, much more. So market gardening is therefore also called a disruptive innovation. Be prepared for it. So let me motivate you. Please get involved. Support your local market garden. <laughs> you can't find one? Found one. If you need more information, please come back to me. And I okay. still have five seconds. <laughs> yes, you, you are perfectly correct. Uh, thank you for being uh, such on time. And thanks for the uh, great talk and presentation. Um, about market gardens and there are a couple of questions I would like to ask you. So uh, you mentioned compost and mulch uh, several times in the talk. Um, how is this type of compost, the special kind of compost you are using, beneficial for soil health and also 
Uh, um, this, uh, you've spoken of um, uh, new cultures of uh, microorganisms um, uh, by bathing and such like that. Can you walk us through how this is beneficial for soil health and what are your expertises in that uh, uh, area? Okay, thank you, Andre, for this question. It's the perfect question, <laughs> I have to say, because uh, we also have a small company called Vermigrant, where we produce compost and vermicompost with the help of earthworms. So these earthworms, they are much, much better in producing a healthy uh, biodiverse microbiome than we can do. So humans, as a human, we cannot produce uh, the diversity of microbes. We cannot produce a uh, microbiome. But the earthworms, they can do the job since hundreds of millions of years. And, and this is important. And if you produce a very good earthworm compost, or if you let it produce by, the, by these guys and by all the microbes and plant roots and so, then you can bring this microbial diversity back when you just cover it cover the seed, the hull of the seed with it. And yeah. when the seed germinates, then it can uh, grow into the soil and multiply there. Yeah, uh, so that, that was what you mentioned with uh, um, uh, seed coating. Um, you mentioned also uh, working seed with, coating, yeah, yeah uh, you mentioned also that you work with research institutes. What studies or research is carried out at the moment uh, in cooperation with you? Well, we are just starting um, a master thesis with uh, Wageningen University this spring, where we want to bring back biodiversity in the soil uh, mm -hmm. with growing different roots. So we know the, uh, the, the research that was done by Jena University in Germany, the so-called Jena experiment. And we want to uh, focus on, on the results and want to apply it in organic farming. So instead of uh, having one uh, single crop like Lucerne uh, for two years in our crop rotation, we want to have a biodiverse uh, mix. And this is just one, one of the projects that we are applying. But we also, for example, we are monitoring uh, biodiversity in our agroforestry system with another uh, uh, research institute here in Austria, with Bioforschung Austria, or with Fiebel. We are testing different, different mixes in flower strips and so on and so on. Okay, and uh, then uh, one last question. Um, you uh, often stress that uh, preventing any form of soil compression in your market garden fields is one of the cornerstones. In which way is this beneficial for soil health and how do you measure that? Well, we don't have to measure it. We can easily see it uh, when we, or, or yeah, that's, that's the type of measure <laughs> that yeah, you yeah, can yeah. see it with your <laughs> naked eye. <laughs> uh, but what we do is we cover the soil with mulch, like a lucerne hay, and we don't touch the soil, so we don't step on the soil, which would be a problem if I, with my 100 kilo plus, <laughs> would go on the soil, then it would be already uh, soil compaction resulting, but we don't drive with, with tractor or anything else. And then the earthworms, if you support the earthworms with the mulch, then the earthworms, they do the digging. So they, they dig into the soil, they create these earthworm burrows, where airflow can be established in the soil, the root can grow, microbes can, can uh, help to support. And so you get healthy soil uh, as you would wish to have it. Okay, uh, Alfred, thank you so much for uh, answering all the questions and the great presentation and the call to action at the end. So when you don't find a market garden, then found one. Um, I really like that, thanks for being here and also uh, Alfred is available for deep dives at the end. Yes. Um, so this was the GFFA innovation pitch and um, the topic of this year's GFFA is sustainable land use food security starts with the soil. And I think we've seen six interesting, ambitious, fascinating projects and when you have not already done so, go to gffa-berlin.de to go into a deep dive with those six projects. And we see them all together.
together here again. Everybody is uh, w uh, waiting for people to join them in the uh, deep dive. Uh, thanks. Thank you to you that you've taken the time and presenting us uh, the different approaches and that you have also reserved more time for individual questions right now in the uh, deep dive. Thank you for being here, watching the uh, innovation pitch. And when uh, you liked it, when you have learned something new, use the has uh, hashtag GFFA on uh, your favorite social media platform and tell us what you liked, uh, share something and uh, maybe get also in contact with all great projects that had the opportunity to present here. So um, this was the GFA, a GFFA innovation pitch. Deep dives are at the end. My name is Andre Lampe. It was a pleasure to be here and to present to you six great projects. And I wish you all a really fruitful, big discussions and a great GFFA further on from this day. Have a nice one.